Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm a Ukrainian Canadian. Today's February 13th, 2023. Now let's get to the news happening in Ukraine, shall we? So I've been out for the last couple of days and there's been a lot of ongoing events in Ukraine. So I first wanted to hit the map situation and the hottest point yet remains to be Bakhmut. You can see that the Russians are still doubling down at attacking everything around Bakhmut and the city of Bakhmut itself. And unfortunately, they were successful at taking the city of Krasnohora, just north of Bakhmut, as you can see here. And the situation looks very critical now. It is critical. At this point, there's only two safe roads uh, left that the Ukrainians can use to resupply their uh, forces in Bakhmut. And as I've repeated previously, it's the T0504 highway. And truly, if the Ukrainians lose control over this highway, it's going to be it's going to be time to leave Bakhmut. The Ukrainian defenders, uh, the Ukrainian soldiers did their job here for the last 10 months. They heroically defended the town of Bakhmut and um, they managed to stop this Russian offensive, which was very, very effective back in, some, in the summer um, at pushing them further. So Bakhmut was very critical for the Ukrainians and they managed to hold their ground here. And at this point, I'm pretty sure that the Ukrainians have built many lines of defense behind Bakhmut, so it's either in Chasivyar they're gonna to have to retreat to or other settlements but at this point if they lose control over this highway here it's going to be time to leave because it's a pocket and you don't want to be in the pocket so let's look at the map here in more detail and you can see more visually that this encirclement is very clear now and so there's no option for the Ukrainian forces here. I really think that unless something miraculous happens, if they manage to pull off a successful counteroffensive in Krasnohra, Solidar, and south of Bakhmut in Klishivka, um, there's nothing else that they're going to be able to do. Um, I think they're going to be able to take back what they lost in the next few months, specifically in spring and summer, but for now to save the lives of all these professional soldiers that are defending Bakhmut, it's going to be time to leave. So that's the first front. Not surprising, we've been talking about Bakhmut for you know since summer of 2022. The other front that the Russians have started pushing is in Kremina. So the Ukrainians had the initiative a few weeks ago, but now the Russians have concentrated a lot of Russian uh, soldiers here. And now they're trying to take back everything that they lost in the last few months. And their push is truly towards Liman. They want to take Liman. They want to go back to Slovyansk or close to Slovyansk. Um, that's their goal right now is to take back Liman and uh, perhaps go towards Slovyansk, which is not going to happen, to be honest. But And the other push they're trying to do here is north of Solidar. As you can see, they're trying to consolidate uh, their gains here in Vesele, Rozdolivka, Pereizne. And so they're trying to also push the Ukrainian forces here and they're trying to create another uh, encirclement as you can see here. So push north of Solidar and push west of Kremina. And this really puts the Ukrainians in a very bad position because now they're going to start feeling a lot more pressure uh, from the Russian units attacking them. Otherwise, there's another front that the Russians have opened, which is not surprising because it's so close to the Russian border, but it's in Dvorichna. You can see there's a road, a main highway that leads from Russia here. So very easy for the Russians to resupply their forces here. So they're trying to open up a new front north of, um, of uh, Kupiansk because it's close to Kupiansk, which is a very important city. Perhaps they want to cross Dvorichna and assault Kupiansk from the north here. And their main goal, as Putin commanded, is to take the entirety of Donbass by March of 2023. So that also involves the Russian units in Vuhledar to continue pushing, which obviously has been a colossal failure for the Russians. I've shared with you an image a couple of days ago of uh, multiple vehicles completely destroyed, Russian vehicles completely destroyed somewhere on the road close to Vuhledar. It shows the, the the idiocracy of the Russian army because they continue pushing through the same roads on the same minefields. They're very well aware that the Ukrainians know exactly where they're gonna be attacking and yet they continue doing that. And they've lost, you know, if not hundreds, perhaps even thousands of soldiers in the last few weeks. Um, 
since they started their operation of Uhladar, massive losses here, and yet they still continue pushing here. Uh, and there's videos every single day out of Uhladar with insane footage of you know units just completely being obliterated by artillery by drones flying over them and just dropping uh grenades or mines over them or bombs over them it's just a, a huge catastrophe for the russian army here uh with tremendous losses but they're going to continue pushing because uh the tsar t told them to do so and again, Donetsk, the same pushes uh, are ongoing since 2014 here. They're really trying to push out the Ukrainian forces away from Donetsk city. Um, so apart from that, nothing really new, but uh, that's the situation. So I've mentioned this in my previous video, the offensive has already started since February. Um, Putin gave the command to take Donbass by March. It's not going to happen. We know why. If they weren't able to do that in 2022 with the element surprise that they had with much better trained troops, um, better equipment, you know, what is going to be the factor that's going to change in 2023 for a victory or for a Russian victory? I don't think there's any factors. There's no magic weapons that the Russians can pull out to change the course of, of the battle. The only thing that they have is a manpower advantage and artillery advantage to this day. And they're also hopeful that the Ukraine is going to lose the West's um, their, uh, their support with all the new weapons. Uh, that have been pledged but as soon as ukraine gets these leopard twos the abrams tanks the leopard ones the cv90s the bradleys these long-range missiles they're going to be uh coming in the next few months by springtime it's i think it's going to be uh a real there's going to be change of tides 100 percent, and it's going to be game over for russia not instantly obviously it's going to take a lot of months for ukrainians to pull this counteroffensive but it's going to be the same thing like in Kharkiv and Kherson. It's going to be slow grinds in the beginning and then a massive collapse of the Russian army. And it's going to be interesting to see um, where the Ukrainians are going to go first. But I think that the most logical point is going to be towards Melitopol because this is going to cut off the Russians completely in the south. And it's going to be very, it's going to isolate essentially all the units in Kherson here and in Crimea. And um, it's going to break this land bridge that Putin created uh, in February and March with his successful push towards Mariupol. So I think that this counteroffensive is most likely going to be uh, focused around uh, south of Urikhiv towards Meritopol. Let me know what you think. So that's that for um, the map updates. Now let's get to the slides and there's a few things to cover. So this is an interesting uh, news report and you can take it with a grain of salt because it's not really confirmed, but it's something that I saw, which I wouldn't be surprised if it was the truth. So there's a new directive apparently that came out, came out from the Kremlin um, in terms of the propaganda that they can spew out to the, to the population. And so here's a few points that um, have been mentioned, including that General Surovikin cannot be mentioned in a positive way, only in a neutral manner. The Wagner PMC and Prigozhin may not be mentioned when discussing combat operations. Do not cite Prigozhin's statements related to the war in Ukraine. Do not mention prisoner recruitment and prisoner participation in the war. And Wagner mercenaries and recruited convicts to be referred to as generic assault squad volunteers going forward. So it's very interesting because you can see that I think most likely Putin is just very afraid of Prigozhin and the influence that he has gained the last few months. He's been really pulling out a lot of propaganda footage, displaying himself as this competent, strong leader, which obviously clashes with what Putin wants. He wants to be the only one labeled as the strong Russian leader. He can only be himself. It's only Putin that can be like that. So he got afraid of how much power Prigozhin was managed to accumulate since uh, the summer of 2022. And so for him, I think it was time to really push Prigozhin aside. Um, and he led Prigozhin to do his last job, which was in Bakhmut. He exhausted the Wagner PMC in Bakhmut. We've seen the reports about 40 to 50,000 dead Wagnerites. Uh, the last few months and so now it's time to push off Prigozhin and reduce the Wagner um, private military force to its pre-2022 era 
which uh, I think personally, the peak of Wagner was between the summer of 2022 and the end of 2022, where he recruited you know, thousands of uh, soldiers. Uh, his propaganda was the strongest. He pulled out a lot of great media footage. Uh, but now you can see that Prigozhin, I've seen many videos of him complaining um, that, uh, you know, Shoigu, Gerasimov and uh, the Russian uh, military Ministry of Defense is not doing enough to help him. So there's a lot of infighting ongoing and it's very interesting to see if this is going to be the case. We'll see with the new narratives uh, within this month and in March what, uh, you know, the propaganda channel is going to be talking and saying. So this is another important update. So this is the Kerch Bridge. If you guys don't or do remember, Ukraine hit this bridge in October. A massive explosion happened here, which destroyed the road section and also damaged heavily the railway section of the Kerch Bridge. So you can see there's latest, the latest pictures are showing that the Russians have successfully renovated the road span and now they're asphalting it. And uh, you can see that um, the railway section is still under repair but it seems like they're going to be able to um, to open it in the next few weeks, most likely. So hopefully there's going to be surprise from the Ukrainian side to render this bridge useless again. And I think it's important because if Ukraine wants to have a successful offensive in Crimea, it's absolutely important to destroy this bridge or render it ineffective. With the push towards Melitopol, as I've shown um, previously on the map, and the destruction of the Kerch Bridge, you've, is you've isolated the Crimean um, Peninsula and um, this is how they're going to be effective at taking Crimea back. And it's also going to cut off uh, any resupply because the Russians have always stood by resupplying their forces with the railways. And so if they don't have a railway, they're not going to be able to uh, push logistical and supply lines towards Kherson and Zaporizhia. So this is going to be very, very important for the Ukrainians to pull off a little surprise. And the good news is that uh, with Zelensky's visit to Great Britain um, last week, they pledged to send some Storm Shadow missiles, which are launched from um, jet fighters, which have a very large range. I think it's like 560 kilometers or miles. I think it's kilometers. So very large range that will be capable of hitting um, the bridge. And perhaps it's not going to destroy it, but it's definitely going to damage it enough that they won't be able to use it anymore. And Ukraine also successfully um, showed footage of their new kamikaze drones that have a thousand kilometer range. So they're capable of building, you know, dozens of them uh, per week or per month. They're going to be great at attacking and destroying, especially the railroad section of the Kerch Bridge. So we'll see what's going to happen. Maybe February 24th is going to be full of great surprises. This is not a surprising news. So uh, this news is from Moldova and um, the Ukrainian government shared intel with um, the president of Moldova, Maya Sandu, that uh, there's a coup d'etat that was sponsored by Russia and is still ongoing. So Russia wants to pull off a coup d'etat in Moldova. And so here in this article, Mentions, mentions that it was uh, it is a short-term plan that involves a sabotage um, involving people with military training disguised as civilians. They're planning violent actions, including attacks on some state institutions and taking hostages. And uh, the president Sandu said that an attempt to seize power in Kishinev is being prepared under the guise of peaceful protests. The president added that the security forces of Moldova are preparing to prevent these provocations and are keeping the situation under control. This is so not surprising. This is the same playbook that was used by Russia in Ukraine back in March 2014, when um, I vividly remember there were many of these, you know, military trained civilians, these little green men and random, you know, Russian agents that um, pulled off a lot of protests in Kharkiv, in Donetsk, in Luhansk, um, in uh, Odessa, and they went for the government institutions, they took over um, the administration buildings and said that we're claiming, you know, independence from uh, Ukraine, we want to be independent. And uh, at that time, you know, Ukraine was very weak following the Maidan rev revolution. So it, it was a very difficult moment, but Ukraine held its ground. But I'm not surprised that the Russians are trying to pull off the same type of, um, of coup d'etat in Moldova now. 
And I'm a strong believer, and I truly believe that Russia would have went for Moldova had it been very had it been successful taking Ukraine. Moldova would have been the logical next country because it doesn't have an army. Um, from what I read, they have less than 10,000 active personnel. They have you know small. Uh, they barely have any vehicles. They don't even have tanks, I think. And so Moldova would not have been good at defending itself or even, you know, uh, counterattacking um, these units that would have taken over these military and um, government institutional buildings. So overall, hopefully none of that is going to be happening. And if it's going to start happening, I think Ukraine needs to pull in, uh, needs to be involved into this because this is going to be a threat for Western Ukraine. And also, let's not forget that there are still Russian soldiers, these so-called peacekeepers in Transnistria, um, that can be used to push for this coup d'état in Moldova. So it's very important that this does not happen because this puts uh, not only threat Ukraine, but all the also the NATO allies. You're going to have Russia literally right beside Romania, which is a NATO country, um, and much closer to the uh, European uh, countries as well. So this cannot happen. And this last video is unfortunate because this is the indoctrination of uh, Russian kids. Um, I think they're Generation Z, so uh, these kids are perhaps 13, 14, maybe 15 years old. And now they're the Putin youth, the basically Hitler Youth 2.0 in Russia. And it's unfortunate because I think, or actually I know, that this there's going to be a lot of work to be done in Russia following a Ukraine victory massive reforms need to happen this is the ideology of russism which is no different from fascism russism is a true ideology that needs to be completely destroyed because it promotes the death of people it promotes uh, brainwashing and um you can see these kids you know unfortunately are being told that it's okay to die from their motherland based on the ego of a few uh, people in Russia specifically Putin and his minions who claim that dying for Russia is the greatest gift and God will accept them with open hands once they die it's unfortunate but this Russian mindset this Russism Russism needs to be completely destroyed before Russia can be reintegrated in um, with the West before that, reforms, reforms, reforms for decades and a lot of uh, retribution payments from the Russian people for what they've caused in Ukraine. And unfortunately, these kids are already being told that, uh, you know, it's okay to die for Mother Russia. So that's that. I appreciate you guys watching my video. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe. Please leave me a comment about what you think for uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive that I mentioned in Melitopol. I think this is where Ukraine needs to strike uh, first during their counteroffensive in the springtime. And uh, I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much and take care.